Okay, well, let's uh, get started. Um, it's an enormous pleasure uh, and privilege to have uh, Ken Freeman joining us from uh, virtually from Australia. Uh, as I uh, said, in one of the things uh, I sent around, Ken is is one of the major figures in in galactic astrophysics, both both big G and small G, um, and uh, has. Uh, both on, on the observational side and, and connecting those observations to theory um, has really led much of, of what we've come to understand about, uh, about galaxies and about the Milky Way uh, in particular. Uh, Ken got his PhD in 1965 from Cambridge University. Uh, uh, we worked with, with Donald Linden Bell um, and uh, after uh, after postdocs at, at Texas and Cambridge, uh, joined the Mount Stromlo Observatory, where he's uh, he's been ever since, um, and it's now part of the Australian National University. Um, uh, among his many prizes are the the Danny Heineman Prize and Henry Norris Russell Lectureship from the uh, from the American Astronomical Society, and also the the Gruber Cosmology Prize. Um, one of his many highly influential articles is his uh, review of, uh, of the new Milky Way with uh, Joss Blind Hawthorne from 2002, which kind of laid out the case for uh, giant high resolution spectroscopic uh, surveys of the galaxy, uh, one of which he now, uh, he now leads, uh, Gala. And, um, and which is uh, you know, just a, a fantastic data set that uh, those of us who, who work in this area are having a great time uh, digging into. And so um, we're delighted to have Ken tell us uh, what he's thinking about. We've experimented with various things on the slides and this was the, uh, the best format we've, we came up with. So he's gonna um, take it away from here. Go ahead, Ken. Okay, thanks, Dan. Okay, so what I'd like to do is uh, just talk about some uh, trends in Milky Way research. These are things that have been happening perhaps over the last decade or sometimes a bit more, but they're, they're um, things that seem to be true a while back and are now they look like they, are, they, they really, really are true. Some of them are good and some of them are, make, make our life difficult. So um, over the last decade, uh, several things have changed in Milky Way research. Some of them make our life more difficult, but those, even those do uh, provide some opportunities. So on the positive side, as David uh, mentioned, we've got um, abundance and age data for enormous samples of stars, you know, hundreds of thousands, literally, from the high resolution um, spectroscopic survey, Apogee, the most, it's not so high resolution, Galar, and there's more of these to come. And the other really important thing that's happened observationally was that we've got six dimensional phase space data for Gaia from for millions of stars. And that's something we really didn't have before 2018. And this is much better than anything we've had before. But there, <clears throat> but there are things that make our life more difficult. Um, and I'm going to talk about uh, three of those in particular um, during this talk. The first one is that the large central bar of the Milky Way means that the potential of the Milky Way is not axisymmetric or time independent in the inner uh, six kiloparsecs. And this, is, this makes things difficult because in that region, energy, angular momentum, and the actions that we use all the time then, uh, are not conserved. Um, there's a phenomenon, <coughs> phenomenon called radial migration of stars that's been around um, maybe for almost 20 years now. It's driven by transient spiral structure. And it means that stars can move from one near circular orbit to another near circular orbit. And there's no evidence that this has happened. And it means that stars don't need to conserve their guiding center radii or their angular momenta. And the third thing that's happening at the moment and that's just unfolding quite rapidly now is that oscillations of the Milky Way mean that the Milky Way is not uh, time independent or in equilibrium. So just before I launch into those, I just want to give a little bit of background on, a, on an important galactic component, which is the, the galactic thick disk. Um, 
we'll see, this is going to pop up several times in the discussion. And I, I just want to say a few words about it. The, this component is an old component. It's at least 10 gig years old. Its chemical properties provide some important clues about the way in which the Milky Way was assembled. Now the thick disk is, as, as, as its name implies, it's, it's, a, it's a thick disk enveloping the, the thin disk, probably has something of the order of 20% of the mass of the thin disk. And it's thick because its stars near the sun have a vertical velocity dispersion of about 40 kilometers a second, compared with the 20 kilometer a second dispersion of the old thin disk stars. This dispersion is too large to be due to secular heating and the origin of the, this high dispersion is still not 100% understood. It could result from mergers long ago, or it's possible that this component was actually born hot. I won't be able to say much more about this. This is one of my favorite uh, subjects, but the possibility that the thick disk was actually born hot from a, 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 a rather turbulent interstellar medium, I think is a very real one. One important thing about the thick disk is that it's enhanced in the alpha elements. These are elements that are produced in um, core collapse supernovae, magnesium, calcium, silicon, titanium in particular. And the, the fact that the disk, this thick disk is enhanced in these elements indicates that it's formed in a rapid burst of star formation. And this rapid burst of star formation was of limited duration. It has to be less than about two giga years. Otherwise the uh, supernovae 1A switch in and they dilute this alpha enrichment. So here's a picture of the thick disk. This is something you don't very often see because it's a rather low surface brightness component. It's not um, the Milky Way. We don't have a picture of the Milky Way uh, thick disk, but we do for this galaxy, which is sort of a, a lookalike um, for the Milky Way. It's NGC 891, fairly nearby galaxy. And um, we've seen uh, some years ago, did some very deep star counts uh, at, with photometry and star counts using the Subaru uh, camera. And this is what turned up. So here, this, this white patch is the, the thin disk, which actually looks like this. That's from a different exposure. There's material out here, which is presumably uh, what we would think of as the halo of our own Milky Way or structure in that halo. But then there's this diamond shape structure here. And that is the thick disk of this galaxy. And it's got this diamond shape. And the fact that it's got this diamond shape means that the isophotes uh, really just depend on, this, on, a, on a linear combination of radius and height above the plane of this sort of form with a couple of scales. And the ratio of those two lengths, the radial length and the vertical length is for this galaxy is about of the order of about 2.2, and it's probably rather similar for the Milky Way. Now we don't know for this galaxy yet, we don't know what, whether it's also got an alpha enhanced thick disk, but I'd certainly put my money on it because there are several um, galaxies that have now been studied using IFUs and have alpha enhanced uh, thick disks. Oops, something here. Okay. Now, just going on with the, um, the alpha abundance in, 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 the, in the thick disk, um, this changes the, the, the relationship between the alpha elements and the, and the ion to hydrogen, that changes with position in the galaxy. There's a very nice and classical paper in 2015 by Michael Hayden, looking at how the alpha to iron, iron to hydrogen ra uh, ratio changed as you went to different um, locations in the galaxy. And I've just taken three panels out of that. I'm looking at a height between about half a kiloparsec and one kiloparsec above the uh, galactic plane. And each one of these little uh, panels shows the relationship between alpha to iron and iron to hydrogen for a large number of stars from Apogee. So this one here is pretty much at the solar radius. And you can see a low alpha component and a high alpha component. And Hayden drew in some lines. It's the same lines in each panel, just to give you a reference. So these stars, slightly more metal poor, 
but well alpha enhanced, these stars are the thick disk stars. These are the thin disk stars. When we go out further in the galaxy, this high alpha structure, the thick disk, pretty much disappears. And all we've got is the thin disk. And we can see that the thin disk has actually moved towards lower metallicity. But as we go in towards the center of the galaxy, which is really the main point here, we find that the fraction of high alpha stars increases dramatically. They become the dominant population in the inner galaxy. And we still have a population that we would identify as thin disk in there. It's moved a little bit to the high metal side, but we can see how the ratio of what we might call thin disk to thick disk or high alpha to low alpha changes dramatically as we move around in the, in, in the galaxy. Okay, so uh, just going to the, 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 the topics that I, I, I raised in the beginning. The first one is this issue with the Milky Way being a barred galaxy. This is a sketch, um, but it's put, it, was, it was put together about a decade ago um, using all the information that was available about the spiral structure of the Milky Way. And, and at that time, not very much was known about the bar. And this was sort of an intelligent guess at how big the bar is. Now it turns out, as you'll see in a moment, the bar is actually rather bigger than, than this. So when we look at the same galaxy, so uh, edge on as we do, of course, from the sun, this is an image in the, in the, uh, in the K band. And we can, the, the things we can see are, are, are the disc, you know, very nice and flat and well-defined. And here in the center, there's this, sort of boxy shaped um, structure, which is really this bit here. And we know from other galaxies and also from, uh, from theory that a boxy bulge is actually associated with a bar in, all, in every case that we're, that we're aware. So if we see a thing like that, we can be pretty sure that underlying that is a bar and we'll see in a moment that that's true. And then in 1991, Blitz and Spurgel, proposed that the Milky Way was barred. And that was based on the complicated H1 kinematics in the inner galaxy. And also on a, an early image at 2.4 microns of, of this nature, it, it didn't really resolve stars, but it did pick up the fact that there was this boxy structure. And already in 1991, the association between boxy bulges and bars was, was known. The real scale of the bar wasn't fully appreciated until a survey of, um, by Wegg and others from, um, from the um, MPE group in Garking, um, using star counts from the BBB infrared survey. And that was a, a, it was a stellar survey. So they used counts of hundreds of thousands of stars to actually map out the bar in detail. And we got some real surprises uh, from that. We shouldn't have got too much of a surprise about the nature of the bar because we know for, we've known now for, for, for many years that about two thirds of these galaxies are in fact barred, although perhaps not quite at this, uh, this extent. Okay, so here are the, the WEG um, counts. So starting, so, so, so what, what was done here, um, there's this, this very large um, infrared survey which, which was really aimed at variable stars, but picked up a lot of uh, non-variable stars, including red giant stars. And red giants are, are very useful because if you can identify a star as a red giant, which is not too hard to do, you, can, you know what its absolute magnitude is to quite high precision. And you can actually, um, you can actually work out the distance and therefore the three-dimensional position of each one of these very large numbers of stars. So that's what Wegg has done. And he's produced these very nice pictures of what the, the inner parts of our galaxy are like. So there's three things here. The first one is, is rather similar to, well, well the, the, these two are slightly different, but rather similar to the infrared image I was, I was showing you before. This one is what the bulge looks like as seen from the sun. And because one end of the bar is closer, or one end of the boxy bulge is closer than the other. There's just the, the expected parallax effect, and you see this is rather wider than it is here. This one is a slice through the center of the 
of the, the bar of the galaxy along, uh, along the major axis of the bar. You can see it's a very nice symmetric structure. This is what it looks like face on. And as I say, this all comes from large numbers of um, infrared magnitudes for plump stars. So what we're seeing here is the boxy bulge. You can see that it's all on the same scale. So we're, we're, we're looking from here about oh, close to 30 degrees from the major axis of the bar. Um, and uh, so this, this boxy thing is really the, the thing in, in the middle here. But the thing that was a little unexpected was that underlying this boxy bulge or boxy bar bulge, there's actually an elongated, um, rather flat bar. And you can see this probably best in, in, in this image here. So this thing that looks just like a very thin disc is in fact this, this bar here. So what comes out of this is that the red clump counts show that there's an underlying flatter bar under this um, boxy bulge that extends out to about five kiloparsecs. And me, can, can, can they really reliably determine all that uh, uh, density distribution on the far side of the galactic center? Um, pre pretty well. Um, the, uh, the, there's no, no sign of, I don't know, increased distance errors or obscuration or anything. The two have uh, yeah. uh, ob 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 obscuration is, is 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 much less of a problem at, at this at this uh, wavelength, um, and they, they, these stars are actually pretty bright. They have K magnitudes around thirteen, um, the, in in the in the center here, and for a big telescope like the Vista telescope, I think this is probably pretty reliable. And they made every correction they could possibly uh, possibly make, just you know the geometric and. And, and what absorption is left. So I, I think they've, they've done a done a pretty good job. So these um, these components, this flat bar and the boxy bulge, they they are probably part of a common structure that maybe 80 years ago or so buckled to form the boxy bulge. So the belief is that all this structure, there's been a huge amount of in-body work done over the last decade on this. The the bar forms just through an instability of a fairly cold rotating disk. And then the bar being an elongated thing uh, becomes fire hose unstable and buckles vertically. And it's that vertical buckling that produces this, this sort of boxy appearance. One of the big surprises here is that the scale height of this thin bar, this thing here, it's only 45 parsecs. And it's very well aligned with the plane of the Milky Way why this should be if there's been much in the way of disturbances is really not clear. But anyway, in total, this bar is something is around 40% of the stellar mass of the, of the Milky Way. Now the pattern speed of this rotating bar, that's fairly difficult to identify. It needs uh, dynamical modeling and it still is a bit uncertain, but the number is somewhere around 40 kilometers per second per kiloparsec which is, a real, is rather slower than people thought before. The circular velocity at the local standard arrest near the sun is taken now at, at around 238 kilometers a second. So the co-rotation radius, where the angular velocity of the bar and the angular velocity of the stars in the disk, where they're equal, that's about six kiloparsecs. So what's the meaning of this for galactic dynamics and kinematics? Well, the kinematical analysis that we do and have done for, for decades for disk stars usually assumes an axisymmetric time independent potential. And disk orbits, which are basically epicyclic, even in the nonlinear um, epicycles, they're, they're epicycles, they have three um, actions which are conserved. There's a radial one associated with the epicycle, a phi one associated with the angular momentum, and a vertical one associated with the sort of vertical vibration energy, or we can think of it in terms of energy and angular momentum, which are traditionally taken as constant because we assume, we assume that the potential is axisymmetric and time independent. Inside about six kiloparsecs, we've got this large bar 
the rotating bar potential is not time independent and it's not axisymmetric. The stellar orbits become much more complex than these fairly, fairly simple orbits that we're used to using in the, in, the, in the outer disk. And there are many different orbit families and stars can flip between these orbit families. Because of this actions may or may not exist in this region and the energy and the angular momentum are not conserved. There is one integral left, which is conserved. Um, and that's the Jacobi integral. It's just a linear combination of the energy and the angular and the Z angular momentum and the constant of proportionality is the angular frequency of the bar itself. And if that is constant, then this integral is also conserved. But bars evolve, are believed to evolve on giga year time scales as they interact with their disks and their dark halos. And therefore the angular frequency of the bar is probably changing slowly. And so this integral may be an integral in the short term, but probably not in the, in the, in the longer term. So this is going to have a big effect. I don't think this is really sunk into the kinematical community yet, but it, it, will, it surely will. Okay, although the potential is, when, when we get outside the bar, say for R bigger than six kiloparsecs roughly, although the potential there is roughly axisymmetric and roughly time independent outside the bar, the effects of the elongated bar do extend well beyond six kiloparsecs because there are resonances between the bar frequency, the angular frequency in the disk, and also the epicyclic frequency. Now these ones, of course, change with radius. This is just a number, and there are various resonances where, where you get linear combinations of these things um, with uh, integer weightings um, that uh, give, give, you, give you some notable resonances. And we'll see, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about one of these just a little, a little bit later. So the, the real point that comes out of this is that stars that venture into the region inside the five kiloparsecs, they will not remember their integrals of the motion except for the Jacobi integral. So what, again, what this means is that although we have accurate proper motions from Gaia and radio velocities from the large uh, spectroscopic surveys, it's going to be difficult to determine orbital properties like the birth radius of stars that people use such a lot uh, for stars that go inside five kiloparsecs in radius until the pattern speed is much more accurately known. So this is a bit of a problem. Okay, so what I want and, to do- And before you go on, we have a question from Sukanya sure. Chakrabarty. Mm -hmm. Hi, Ken. Uh, so Hello. outside of um, 6KPC, the potential could also be time uh, dependent, right? Mm -hmm. Due to dwarf galaxy interactions and uh, other, uh, other dynamical effects. So I, um, I'm, I'm assuming the inside of 6KPC are primarily referring to the, to the bar. Yes, that's right. And, and, and the point about the six kiloparsecs is that you don't have to get very far outside of an elongated distribution like the bar before the asymmetry in the potential disappears. Yep. Uh, really a, a kiloparsec and it's almost all gone. Um, it's just because potentials are, are more are rounder than the density distributions, but, yep. it, but that's a, it's a real effect. Okay, thanks. Okay, so um, what I wanna talk about now is continuing with the bar, but also the bulge. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of going to be looking here more at the chemical and the kinematical, particularly the chemical properties. So as I mentioned earlier, in-body models show how a boxy bar bulge can grow from the bar forming instability of a rotating stellar disk. The bar grows, goes far, has unstable, buckles vertically and generates the boxy inner structure. And the sort of orbits that arise out of this buckling are things that look like this. So this is in the vertical direction. This is along the bar. And you can see these orbits have this sort of pretzel-like um, shape. And they're the things that make the boxy bulge look a bit boxy. But what I want to do now is just look at the, uh, not so much, the, I, I won't do much on kinematics. I want to look at the chemical properties of the bar bulge for insights into this whole process of growing a bar and, and buckling out of a pre-existing disc. And in that process, the thick disc, which we mentioned, has got a role. Okay, so the galactic bulge, as I say, it's, it, 
believed to come because of its boxy nature, believed to come from bar instability and, and buckling rather than being driven by mergers. It's made up, this structure here, it's made up of stars from the thin and thick disks that were present at the time of instability. And in more recent large samples of bulge stars, the statistics are good enough that we can see remnants of these components, the, the, the constituent disks. We can see those in the metallicity distribution function of the bulge stars. And these proportions change with position over the bulge. So what I'm going to show you now is how is, is the metallicity distribution function um, averaged over two latitudes. This one here at about five degrees, and that's, that's this panel. And this one here at about, um, uh, sorry, five degrees is this one. 10 degrees, which is this one. So here we're really almost outside the, the, the peanut, or outside the sort of peanut structure, but, but not quite. And th this is some work that Melissa Ness did for her thesis using data from a, a quite large bulge survey that we did with about 28,000 uh, stars some, some years ago. So it's got some annotations on it that uh, John Cormody made that I've, I've preserved. So, the thing that turned up because there were so many stars, I mean, in, in, in this zone alone, she's got 42,000, uh, 4,200 definite uh, bulge stars. You can see that the metallicity just, well, first of all, you can see it's quite wide. It goes from about plus a half in Fe over H to about minus one. It's got a few metal poor stars in it, which I don't think are very relevant to this discussion. They're, they're probably in a halo or just a metal weak tail of the thick disk. But you can see that there are three components that pop up in the statistics. And the other thing you can see is that when we go from minus five degrees to minus, 15, uh, minus 10 degrees, we've got the same components, but just the fractions of each component are different. See here, this metal rich component is quite important at minus five degrees, becomes quite unimportant or relatively unimportant when we go to minus 10 degrees. Um, so this component is a rather metal rich component that we don't see much of it near the sun. And it appears to be the younger metal rich thin disc that was around at that time. This component here is rather like the thin disc near the sun. It's a uh, mostly subsolar, although it's got, a, it's got a, some stars that are probably just above the solar abundance. So this is like the thin disc near the sun. And this thing here, is very much like the thick disk that we see pretty much everywhere in the Milky Way, including near the sun. Population that's sort of mainly between about minus a half and minus one. Now that's a much more significant population, no surprise, when you're up here, because the thick disk is thick. And so most of the disk stars up in here, this part, are going to be um, thick disk stars. Now the other thing that uh, came as a bit of a surprise was that when we look at the stars that actually define this sort of dimply um, boxy bulge structure, the, the stars that contribute to that are only these two components, A and B. This thick disk component is not involved. It just doesn't seem to be part of this boxy structure at all. Um, people suspect, and you know, I think this, this makes sense, that the reason is that um, these stars are rather kinematically hotter and are probably less involved in the whole instability process, but they still are involved. But it, it, it was just notable that the, the peanut shape, the boxy, boxy shape is really just driven by stars with abundances greater than about minus 0.5. And I think that's just a, a dynamical um, issue. Okay, now that was uh, for, for giants. And giant, giants are fine, but at the time we were doing this, um, it was not possible to get ages for the giants. The belief was that all the stars in the bulge are old, um, but um, Thomas Bensby was interested in looking at um, bulge dwarfs. Now bulge dwarfs are two, he does high resolution spectroscopy. Um, he, he, he measures um, very nice abundances, but um, he just couldn't do that on dwarfs that are in situ unless 
they were being microlensed. Now, fortunately, there is a lot of microlensing going on of bulb stars by other bulb stars. And so he was getting, um, uh, he was getting alerts from the Ogle team when a microlensing event was starting. The microlensing events last for, for days, weeks, sometimes months. So there, there, there was time, sometimes they wouldn't um, progress far enough for him to do this. But anyway, he was able to put together of order in the end of order 100 microlens bulged dwarfs. So these are just typical bulged stars or so, so we believe. And the first big surprise that really took a long time to convince people of was that the bulge is not all old at all. That it's got quite a significant young component. And here we've got metallicity against age. So here's age of zero, here's age of 14. Here are the three components that we were looking at before. A, the metal rich bulge, B, the not so metal rich bulge, C, the, um, the, the, uh, the, the thick disc ones. And what, what we can see there is that there are, in this metal rich population, we were only looking at, at giants in the work I showed you in the previous slide, but you can see there's a lot of these stars um, you know, he was looking down at fairly low galactic latitude with lots of these stars and they cover the whole age range. The slightly more metal core uh, thin disc also covers a, a rather similar range. And it's not until we get to the thick disc stars, which are these ones here. Now these are color coded by their alpha abundance. So red alpha abundances means they're enhanced. Um, so it's not until we get down to these that we see a population that's really predominantly old. Now he was at low latitude, so his population was really dominated by these these these, these metal metal rich stars. So um, the other thing that was was interesting and hasn't been available until really quite recently is some information about the metallicity of this thin bar that we can see lying along here. And that came through the um, Apogee uh, survey, also by uh, Melissa Ness, who's part of that survey. And so what we've got here is, again, a galactic latitude longitude map. This thing here going out to not quite to 10 degrees in longitude. This is the boxy bulge, this, this, this bit here. And then going out from about 10 to 30. Uh, here's, here's longitude 30, so that's really the end of the, th of the thin bar. This thing here is the thin bar. So you can see it is fairly thin, but the uh, thing that turned up from that, as you can see, here's the metallicity coating and here's the alpha abundance coating. So red metallicities are fairly high. <clears throat> so you can see here, the boxy bulge has got a big range of abundance, which we knew, but what we didn't know <coughs> was that the thin bar is actually quite metal rich. It's, it's really part of this very flat component. And the reason why we're seeing more and more metal rich stars as we go down to lower and lower latitude is that we're just getting more and more of this thin stuff coming into the sample. And with the alpha abundances for the same population, we can see that they're down around zero. So this is a metal rich alpha core um, population very much like what you might find in, in the galactic disk. So that was that, that was that was really something quite new. Okay, um, now just to emphasise the importance of the thick disk in all in all this, there was some, a couple of very nice theoretical papers by Fred Cootie um, a few years ago, and what and what she was doing was um, trying to see if she could inner end body model to, she was, she was trying to also get the abundances right. And she took various starting conditions uh, and then just let, let those evolve both kinematically and chemically or dynamically and chemically and just see what, what came out. So here's, um, she, she, she did two models in particular. One of them she called M1 and that's this one. And it starts with a metal rich uh, thin disc and an intermediate thin disc and a substantial more metal poor thick disc. So very much like what I've been talking about. M2 was a very different model. It was just, just took a single disc 
with a steep metallicity steep gradient. So same metallicity range, but initially arranged in a rather different way. And here, here's the outcome. This is the, um, here's the map of the, um, of the sort of uh, the um, central bulge and the and, and the thin part of and the thin part of the bar uh, and color coded in the same color coding. So red is is is, is metal rich, and this is what she got from M M one, very much like what the galaxy actually looks like. And when she went to the M2 one, it was a completely different thing. She got this very metal rich nucleus and a rather, um, a rather okay, here, here's, the, here's the metallicity coding and the rather uh, metal poor um, outer parts. So it really does indicate that this um, inner thick disk is actually quite an important part of the process that led to the center of the galaxy looking like it does. So the, 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 I think the point of this is the presence of the thick disk before the bulge seems important. And we see the thick disk component in really all of the survey data that's around four bulge stars. There's much more that I've, I've shown here, but I've tried to, to sort of pick out some, some examples. Okay, so a summary of the bulge bar properties, um, looking ahead to discussions of metal rich stars in, in the solar neighborhood. So the components of the inner disk that are now part of the bulge, we see them in the MDF as metallistic components of the bulge. The metal rich stars are alpha poor and they appear to only form in the inner galaxy. We don't see stars like that forming anywhere else. Um, and they appear to migrate out into the solar neighborhood. That's really what the next bit of this talk is about. And we saw that the, the boxy bar bulge is embedded in a longer, thinner um, metal rich bar with pretty much solar um, or super solar solar abundance and um, solar, low solar, FE over H, uh, alpha to FE. Okay, so we've discussed the chemical structure of the bar bulge, including the metal rich stars, which lie mostly near the galactic plane. Um, so what I'm going to do now is, is look at the metal rich um, stars near the sun, which are believed to form only in the inner galaxy, but which are found in the solar neighborhood and they appear to have migrated from the inner galaxy. So what I'm looking at here is the age metallicity relation for stars near the sun. So here's metallicity, here's age. These are all stars within a few hundred parsecs of the sun. I put a line at an abundance of plus 0.2. So these stars are really quite metal rich. And you see there's lots of them at all ages in, in, in the local neighborhood. And the question is, where did they come from? So they're unlikely to have formed in the solar neighborhood because when we look at stars that are forming now in the solar neighborhood, these are B stars which formed basically probably less than 10 million years ago. They have abundances very close to um, 0, 0.0, the solar abundance. Very nice work by Shabila some time ago. We only see metal rich young stars in the inner bulge um, and those were, we saw that in the micro lens dwarfs. So the star, the metal rich stars that we see in the solar neighborhood, they're believed to have migrated from the inner galaxy. And there are at least three possible migration routes. I just want to be very brief on this. Um, there's the classical uh, radial migration that's been around for about, uh, in the literature for about 20 years. It's driven by transient spiral structure. And these transient torques move stars from one near circular orbit to another near circular orbit. This works best for stars that are already in near circular orbits with fairly low um, random velocities. Um, this, this is a, a, in, in some ways a very interesting process. In other ways, it's very annoying because you see a star in a circular orbit, you assume that it was born in that circular orbit and that is by no means true at this stage. The other way, other couple of ways you can get migrations, you can have a major event with time varying change in the asymmetric potential. The time variation is essential because otherwise you have the Jacobi integral and it doesn't really allow things to change very much. And one such example would be the formation of the bar about eight years ago, eight years ago. This would have been a big event and it really would have 
cause a lot of migration. And you can see this in simulations. The third um, way things can migrate, they can be trapped near co-rotation um, by neutral points in the bar. And I'll, I'll just say a tiny bit on this. What that can do, it can, it can waft stars out into the solar neighborhood from the inner galaxy on eccentric orbits. And they, this would be a, a repetitive process. Stars will come and go. But the thing you will expect is that these stars will be moving radially. So they'd be, when you look at their U velocity, that's the radial component of the velocity, you expect some asymmetry. You expect, either expect them to be going out or going in. So uh, let me just show you that. Okay, so this, I, I'm particularly interested in this. I have to sneak a, a slide in on, on this. Um, this. This shows you kind of how this bar trapping works. So here, here's a bar, it's rotating like this, and we're in the rotating frame. There's some neutral points which are define co-rotation. Um, and the one I'm interested in here is this one off on the minor axis. It's usually called L L4. There's a symmetrical one on this side. L4 for realistic parameters of the, the disk that's underlying all this and the bar, L4 is a, a trapping site for a whole sequence of uh, periodic orbits. Now the bar is rotating this way. These orbits are rotating counter to the rotation of the bar. These are very stable orbits. You can perturb these very hard and you get quasi periodic orbits that sort of loaf very slow. This area is a very low potential gradient and there are stars that vibrate around these periodic orbits. Now there's a whole family of these of different sizes. I'm only showing you results for just, just one. This entire area here is covered by orbits that are vibrating around this and, and they're stable and they're trapped. Um, they're, they're vibrating around the sort of periodic orbit. So these things are coming out um, past. So here's the sun. It's all scaled and roughly geometrically right. These orbits are, are, are wafting out past the sun. Now, in the particular orientation that we are at here, these orbits will be going outwards. Now, if you were somewhere else, they'd be, they, they could well be going, going, in, going inwards. So if we just, if we just, just um, remember that, that the effects of this kind of orbit trapping is that you, you would see these stars as they pass through on their, on their way out. They're in quite eccentric orbits, but they will go around. This takes quite a long time, but they'll reappear and we'll see them every few giga years. Okay, this is, has, there's an application to this. This is Gaia data for the local uh, neighborhood around us, it shows you the velocity, um, the outward velocity, and this one shows you the angular momentum. Uh, this, this could equally well be the, the azimuthal velocity. And what shows up here in this Gaia figure is a, a bit of a mess, which is the low velocity stars. And when we get down here, we see a feature which has been long known, it's called the, the Hercules stream or moving group. And you can see Here's zero outward velocity. These stars are predominantly going out. And various people have suggested that these Hercules stars are trapped orbits around the stable Lagrange points. Just the sort of thing I was just uh, talking about. The stars in here, they've got no particular chemical properties. They're just a random collection of, of stars. So, um, yeah, so, so going on now with these metal, metal uh, rich stars in the solar neighborhood. Um, the age velocity relation for one of the big surveys, which just we, 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 we've seen stars from this before, they're, they're, it's a sample of stars within a few hundred parsecs of the sun. And looking just at the metal rich ones, just to see what they do, these ones here look as if they have actually formed near the sun. They're about two giga years old. They're vertical velocity dispersions, that's the W motion. Is only about 11 kilometers a second there. That's about as cold as you ever But They can't have formed near the sun because the things that are forming near the sun are much more than before. But these must have migrated and they must have done it in a terrific hurry because they're, they're only a couple of giga years old. Now, unfortunately, we can't, for this, or this, in this kind of data, we can't get ages really that are, that are much younger than about, uh, about two giga years. When you look at the older ones of these stars, you do get older ones. 
they are sort of six to 10 giga years old. They have um, for, uh, velocity dispersions of around 18. That's very typical for old thin disk stars. So these, if you didn't, uh, if you didn't, didn't have doubts about whether these sort of stars could form near the sun, you would think these are just very normal uh, disk stars. The, just the parameters are really, really, um, really very normal. Now, um, Hayden uh, had a look at these particular stars. He, he's, he's got an interest in these. This, these are from the Gaia ESO survey. Um, and what he, what he noticed with these, so he's looking here at stars, similar stars, uh, abundances greater than about minus one. He looked at the perigalactic radii that you infer for these. Now, of course, this was not including the presence of the bar. And he looked at the eccentricities. Now, what he saw is that about half of these stars have got eccentricities less than 0.2. So they're really in very near circular orbits. So that's all these ones down here. About um, more than 20% of them have got perigalactic distances greater than seven kiloparsecs. So they're all the time in away from the bar. They're all the time out near the sun. And again, it seems very likely that these stars have migrated from the inner galaxy. And this particular result was confirmed by the same person, but using a, a bigger sample from, from, uh, from Galar. But the other thing you can see is that some of these stars have perigalactica, not worrying about the bar, that actually fall well into the bar region. And just what is really happening with those, I think is really not, not, not very well understood. So metal rich stars in eccentric orbits near the sun, they're, they're also known. There's an interesting sample of those was put together a decade or so ago, 71 high metallicity nearby dwarf disk stars. Abundance is going up to almost to 0.6. Now these were chosen to have high eccentricity orbits, but not go very far from the plane. I can't remember how far up they go, but it's not far. All of these have solar alpha to iron, just like the inner, inner galaxies. And the thing that turned out about these is that the stars with a V velocity, an azimuth velocity, less than about 30, have mostly positive U motion. So up here we can see, so the stars we're talking about are these black ones, the thin disk stars, which weren't part of the sample, they come from somewhere else. They're sitting up here near zero, zero velocity. These ones down here, you can see up here, only a few stars, but roughly symmetrical, like the thin, like the thin disk stars. When you get to these higher velocity things, you've got this very asymmetric distribution of, of U velocities. Now these are all going outwards. Um, the, the convention for U changes from person to person, but these here, here they're going outwards. Um, so this looks very much like the sort of things I was talking about with Hercules and the bar trapping that one way to get these things would be that they are wafting out, trapped around the, the neutral point um, at, at co-rotation. And, that, and that's really what we're seeing. Now, the same stars, I'll, I'll, I'll be, be quite brief on this. Um, the same stars, these high eccentricity, rather metal rich stars, a couple of samples have been studied of those. So here, here's, one, here's one sample from Apogee. Here's the age of these stars against the abundance. These are the stars we're looking at. They have ages that are typically about five, five to six giga years. An independent sample of very similar, otherwise very similar um, by Jane Lynn using Galar gives you ages of around, uh, around seven. So these high eccentricity stars, uh, probably the same ones that we were looking at here, the ages of these things appears to be somewhere around the seven uh, giga year mark. So just to, just to summarize that, um, the, the metal rich stars near the sun are believed to form from the inner galaxy and migrate out. Um, near the galactic plane, they're mostly young stars with small velocity dispersions, some older stars with higher dispersions. Why that happens is really not clear, but away from the plane, they're much older and they have these asymmetric U velocity distributions. Radial migrators, through the classic radial migration system, they're stars with small velocity excursions, which are 
most prone to migrate through uh, transient spiral structure. This may be why we see so many of these rather cold, fairly young metal rich stars in the Geneva Copenhagen sample, the small sample. The old hotter ones could be bar, bar migrators or they could be even associated with the bar forming event. But anyway, the, the, the bottom line of this, this section is that the radial migration of stars driven by transient asymmetric gravitational effects is one of the most important uh, developments of the past decade plus. Stars are, are now known to typically migrate by something of the order of 3.6 kiloparsecs uh, standard error, standard deviation over about eight uh, giga years. Very nice paper by Frank Ulrichs and Ting on this a, a few years ago. So um, time is marching on. Um, should I try and, and, and wrap up here? I've got one more section which will take about uh, probably five or 10 minutes, but I can e easily skip that. Uh, and just concerning the other equ equilibrium um, galaxy, what, what would you prefer? Shall I, shall I just go Why don't you give it, try to give us the sort of five minute version of this and then, and then we, okay. can, we can run a little bit past with yep. the questions? Okay. Um, all right, well, th this, is, this is the last bit. It's just about the outer equilibrium galaxy, which is a, a rapidly evolving uh, subject. Um, the, the data that goes into this is, um, goes back in about a decade. And it's, it's just the fact that uh, people, when they were, they were looking at the vertical distribution of stars near the sun, they could see that there was an asymmetry um, I, I won't go through what this asymmetry is, but it has this particular form. Um, at, at about half a kiloparsec, it's going in one sense, goes back at about one kiloparsec and then flattens out. And there are kinematics uh, to match. And when we look at local star forming cloud complexes associated with Gold's, Gould's belt, a completely different sample, we see a very similar um, structure to this. Here, here they are projected down onto the plane. It's a long, thin filament. It's been known for a very long time that this thing undulates with the plane. And looking in from this side, uh, can you see my cursor okay? Yeah, uh, looking in from this side, this is what you see is a sort of a, a wiggle, very much like the wiggle that we saw in, in the stars. Looking in from here, you see this view and it's really just a, just a lump. It's a very thin undulating um, structure. And the, the, the really hard drama with this subject, this was sort of pottering on, but it, when the uh, second Gaia release came out, um, probably driven by this sort of stuff, um, uh, uh, Teresa Antoja was looking just in this sort of little volume here to see if she could pick up any sign of these sort of corrugations that people had been talking about in the, in the galactic plane. And um, she, she plotted up the stars that she, that she had. She had several, several million uh, Gaia stars with six dimensional uh, face space coordinates. And she was just looking at the distribution in Z, the height and the, and the velocity. So this is like a one dimensional face space diagram. And in this diagram, a single star would typically be going round and round at some frequency. And a typical star in here, near the center, near the galactic plane would be going around, but with a, a different, uh, more rapid uh, frequency. So any structure gets really washed out into a sort of a spiral by the fact that the inner parts are being uh, moving around their, their face based trajectory quite quickly. The slower ones are going rather more slowly. And you get these phase space spirals and everybody who's taught galactic dynamics will have, have taught people about these things. This caused an enormous stir. This is a, a two dimensional histogram and not coded by number. It's coded by the phi uh, velocity, which is a quite a sensible thing to do but I, I can't really go, go into it. But this was very quickly associated with a phase mixing disturbance from some sort of interaction, probably with the Sagittarius dwarf galaxy. Now that's not the only way this could, could arise, but it's, it's certainly the, the way that it's, it's caught on at the moment. And this might be the start of galactic seismology using oscillations of galaxies 
as diagnostics of the underlying impact history and properties. And in a sense, it's analogous, but I don't think it would be as powerful as astroseismology is for stellar structure. You're really just looking at the way a galaxy can respond to various impulses. Um, one thing which I'll, I'll, I'll just mention, I, 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 won't, I won't try and explain. There was a lot of interest to know how this spiral, whether this was present in other regions of the Milky Way. And so people looked further out. Here are two versions of this. One is where the stars have been binned by their present day radius, eight, nine, 10, 11 kiloparsecs. And the other one was not where they were binned, not by their present day radius, but by their guiding center radius. So it's just it's basically by their angular momentum. Now that makes a lot of sense. I, 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 I won't go into why it makes a lot of sense, but you would expect if this really was a phase mixing thing, you would expect the spirals to be much better defined when you've been in guiding center radii than when you've been in present day radius. And that's actually what happened. The other interesting thing was that when you go further in, when you go to seven and six KPC, the phase spirals in both, um, both of these binnings are quite poorly visible. And that may well be the effect of the bar because the bar will upset this whole process that I was talking about with the, with the phase mixing. So that, that was really it. Uh, galactic seismology, it may be a useful diagnostic and people are now going into this trying to see how galaxies ring. It's quite a complicated thing. Um, the impulse appears to generate two, M equals two, cos two theta type uh, imposed responses. One is a spiral density wave, just a usual spiral density wave. And the other one is a bending wave. And these two waves have different frequencies and they wrap up at different rates and with the density wave propagating over the top of this uh, bending wave. But in the end, the thing that comes out of this is that the bending wave generates this sort of corrugated structure. So summary, um, the, uh, the significance of the central bar um, was one of the points I tried to make. Galactic dynamics becomes more complicated, more difficult, and quite interesting. I've worked in this area all my life and I'm quite enjoying the way this is evolving. Um, the thick disk, the role of this is uh, very important. There's some things I would have loved to have uh, talked about but, but couldn't. Um, but I think the thick disk is really the key to much of the early assembly. Radial migration is uh, very important for understanding the evolution of the disk and the fact that the disk is not in equilibrium. And the hope that large scale oscillations may provide some new diagnostics. So that really brings me to the end. Thank you for your patience. Um, I'll just leave up a commercial for the Galar third data release, just to mention it's 600,000 stars um, with a lot of element abundances, including some neutron capture elements and value added catalogs for ages and uh, dynamics, much of which I think will be affected by the things I've been talking about with the asymmetries. Okay, thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Ken. Um, and uh, so uh, lots of results in there. So I took, there's lots of questions. Um, we'll probably start to lose some people, but I think we can go for sort of 10, 10 minutes or so now. Um, and then uh, I'll also uh, remind people that we'll have a, a, a follow-up conversation on Monday at 9 a.m. our time, which is merely 11 p.m. for Ken. Um, <laughs> so uh, when uh, he's uh, had a chance to, uh, to, to rest up. But, um, but let's take some questions now. I'll ask one, which is on the, the cold, young, metal-rich stars, um, where you say they probably migrated. Is there any reason to think they migrated other than their high metallicity, and in particular, um, I'm thinking about, you know, there, there are arguments from the white dwarf luminosity function from star counts that, you know, maybe there was a, uh, enhanced star formation, a sort of factor of two ish enhanced star formation 2 billion years ago. And so, you know, could it be that, that kind of self enrichment from that, uh, star formation actually gave rise to this, this cold component. And I hadn't realized this, this, uh, this small velocity dispersion, which seems like a quite interesting result. 
Yeah, um, certainly the driver for all this was the, the high abundance and also the fact that the stars that are now forming in the solar neighborhood are substantially more metal poor. This problem, this problem has been around for, for decades and people have talked about radial migration without having a, a mechanism really until 2002 when uh, the Benny Solwood uh, mechanism was, was, was published. Um, now, I mean, the way you could get out of this is by having some sort of an infall event where you are sat where the solar neighborhood might have been rather more metal rich in the past and has been diluted by a more pristine gas so that we're being deceived. Um, there's nothing in the orbits of the stars that indicates anything that would make you suspicious that, that, they, that they have migrated. It's just simply the sub high, high metallicity. Okay. I mean, the, the hotter ones certainly look like they like they would naturally have been been migrated, but yep. but the ones that are there in in two billion years. Yeah, that's, that's right. Um, Scott, um, suppose you take migration really enthusiastically and you say that the uh, old stars have been completely churned around and they have there's no correlation between their current guiding center radius and their initial mm -hmm. guiding center radius. Is there anything in the data that's inconsistent with that? Um, well, not, nothing I can think of um, right away. Um, the, the, the paper by Frankel at, at Al that I mentioned uh, shows how using metallicity as an indicator of where a star was born, which may, may or may not be the right thing to do. If you, if you do that, um, you can really see the effect of the migration in broadening the abundance gradient for the stars that the, these folks were using. Um, and I think because it, it looks like it looks like they represented it as a random effect, and I think that's probably a pretty, pretty good way to do it. Um, it you know, I mean this is a suggestion there is that there isn't much of a much of a much of any much of a of a relationship because the way the migration seems to work for people who've actually modeled the dynamics of it is that it goes in small steps. And it walks, the star is walked by these uh, you know, spirals, short lived spiral se segments. It's walked along a, a curve that takes it from one nearly circular orbit to another one. So the star is transformed maybe in many steps from a circular or near, a near circular orbit to another near circular orbit, pretty much like what we're seeing for those young metal rich stars. And it, 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 this can go in either direction and presumably it goes in both directions. It's just like a, a, a sort of a, a, a random walk that you finish up going in some direction, but it's not, a, not necessarily a, a, a process that's always taking you in the same direction. But isn't there still a radial metallicity gradient of old stars or do we not? No, that, that, that's really what Frankl, Frankl et al were, were using. It's there, but it's very messy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, quite a big dispersion. Whereas um, when you look at the radial gradient, say for Cepheid stars, which are probably around 10 to the eight years old or a little bit less, that's a bit, that's quite tightly defined. Uh, but when you uh, then go to stars that are rather older, it gets much fuzzier. And they use that fuzziness as an indicator of the amount of migration you actually get. And that's where that 3.6 kiloparsecs um, signal comes from. So Kanya? Um, hi Ken, uh, as you mentioned, uh, there are a number of um, observational manifestations of out of equilibrium effects like the uh, asymmetry and the star counts and SDSS and the phase space spiral. Um, what does the metallicity distribution look like uh, along these features? Is there any correlations um, that one can see with these, you know, uh, asymmetries. Sorry, which, which features were you thinking of? Um, so, so um, if for the SDSS um, star count asymmetries. And oh, oh, in, in the asymmetries, yes, I see. Um, look, I, I, I'm, I'm not aware of any, um, okay. but that doesn't mean they're not there. So, <laughs> so yeah, no, but it, it's an interesting thing to see. Because I mean, hopefully you'd, you'd expect that there wouldn't be much 
change in metallicity if it really was just a, a corrugation. Right, and as well as in the Gaia phase space star spiral. Um, I'm not aware of anything there, but that may be my problem. <laughs> uh, yeah. Roman? Uh, hi, Ken. Uh, you Roman? mentioned uh, in, in the end of, of the talk that uh, encounter with uh, Sagittarius Dwarf could have uh, uh, excited the spiral, uh, I guess, in mm -hmm. the outer galaxy. I mean, yes. obviously, well, spiral can also be excited by the bar itself. Um, yep. So my question is, uh, do we, uh, I mean, do we understand, first of all, the geometry of the spiral structure in the galaxy, you know, based on Gaia data and all this uh, uh, radial velocity service, uh, uh, what it is and, you know, what geometry is and what is the contribution of each different uh, uh, stirrers, perturbers, uh, to yeah. generating the spiral structure? Yeah, I mean, my, my understanding is that, that the spiral uh, structure at this sort of rather low level is, isn't very well understood at all. I mean, this would be a very difficult thing to to map. I mean, that, that, that would be the hard part of using this, would be to actually measure what the disturbances are that you're uh, trying to use it as, 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 a, as, a, as a diagnostic. Um, but, um, I mean, my, my own suspicion when the Antoka spiral first turned up is that it was something to do with the bar, and I'm still working on that just to see if it actually does work. Um, I haven't got very far with it yet, um, but uh, I, I suspect we're going to find that the, the bar does all sorts of things um, to to the, the structure in, in, in the outer parts, even though in in those outer parts the asymmetry is is quite weak. And there's a fluctuating vert vertical field that comes from having a bar thrashing around in the inner parts of the galaxy. That must be doing something as well. So I think there's some very interesting things to work on there. Okay, thanks. Ken, one of the things you said, which I, which struck me, uh, I didn't know was, was this 45 parsec scale height for yeah. the thin bar. I mean, that seems fantastically low. And I thought bars heated things up. So, you know, what, so first of all, that's that's once you go outside of two or three kiloparsecs or yep. something. And exactly, exactly. That's right. Yeah, it, it's about three kiloparsecs. Yeah, you, you you get into this very very flat area. Now my suspicion, and I haven't done anything on this yet, but I plan to, is that this may be one of these complicated orbit things that you get when you get when you have these very asymmetric. Um, rotating potentials. The, the orbit structure in there is immensely complicated and very, it's very brittle. Uh, you know, tiny changes to orbit initial parameters give you, you suddenly flip, the, flip a star into another, um, in, into another orbit family. And I, I, I suspect it may be just a phenomenon associated with a rather steady bar that the thing is basically, it basically throws out any star that's, that's trying to get into an orbit it has more than, you know, of order 100 parsecs vertical extent. Um, but we'll, you know, I, I really don't know. That's, that's just a conjecture at this stage. And, um, but I, I suspect it's, it's something that comes as a package with the bar because it's just so cold. I mean, the restoring force in there is pretty high. But it still is, it's, it's a very, very cold population. And there must be a reason why. I've asked various people why, but they, they don't have any really convincing input yet. So it would be that, that only these very vertically cold orbits can stay trapped in the bar. Yeah, exactly. But the others will finish up in a, some sort of more three-dimensional uh, distribution. And the fact that it is a bar with the small scale height is coming from asymmetry of counts or from, from uh, how, how is it, how are you separating the bar from the the disk at, at oh, it, it, it's 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 coming as I understand it just directly from the three dimensional distribution of these stars, which is is known. There's no deep projection involved, yeah, right. because the the um, the absolute magnitudes are, are known to. I can't remember what the fraction is, but it's it's tiny, so it gives you distances of of order five percent. Um, so you, you you really know everything about these stars. You, you don't know all the kinematics that you would like to know. All right, any other questions before we let Ken remember that it's past two? <laughs> <laughs>
All right, well, thank you so much. Uh, this was a very rich talk with all sorts of uh, things for us to think about. And um, some of us will, will talk to you again on Monday. So.